So talk one uh, today, uh, like I said, collective title is Bad King, Good King. Talk one is titled Lost Without the King. And talk two will be titled In Love with the King. So this morning we're going to look at Lost Without the King. And uh, I said turn to 1 Samuel 12 in a sense that was, uh, as is often the case, uh, a little bit ahead of the game. Uh, we're going to go through 1 Samuel. I'm going to go through a number of chapters in 1 Samuel. I kind of want to keep your, uh, ask you to keep your finger in that place. But we are going to do a whistle-stop tour uh, of kind of context before we get to uh, 1 Samuel and particularly uh, the work of Samuel and then into Saul. And we're going to start right at the start of Judges. So uh, you might want to put your finger in Samuel, but we are going to go uh, back to Judges. And we are going to build a background together, starting in Judges 1, verse 1. Judges chapter 1, verse 1. And I'll read it for us. I'm reading from the New King James Version, just in case anyone needs to know. Now, after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall be first to go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? So post Joshua, there is still work for God's people to do, isn't there? There's still Canaanites to expel from the land that God had given his people. But apparently, there's no designated heir. There's no one to pass the baton on to. And it's an interesting question, isn't it? I wonder, couldn't Joshua find anyone suitable? And it sometimes happens that way. And we're meeting together to pray and to look at God's word together at a time when perhaps we can relate to this a little bit more than we would ordinarily be able to do. Purely because we seem to be going through leaders and not finding one which is suitable. But I want you to see something very striking here uh, in the verse uh, that I just read. There's something surprisingly direct and surprisingly corporate about the nature of God's interaction with his people here. It's striking, isn't it? There doesn't appear to be an intermediary here. It's God's people together coming and speaking with God and God speaking with them. And we're going to look at a little bit uh, about that uh, more shortly. I want you to see also the people's longing for someone to lead the charge. And is it not the deep human need at all times that all of us have? Uh, I like what David Guzik, the Bible commentator, says uh, about this season. He says they were in a critical place where they had to trust God more intimately than they ever had before. And I wonder at that moment in time, did the Israelites hanker after the past? Were they full of misgivings, perhaps, about the future? I'm sure they were. And it's interesting as we meet, um, at least from the perspective of our nation, but also from the perspective of IFB. uh, We've prayed much recently about the big change that's happened in our nation uh, with the Queen uh, and the King. Uh, we've also lost uh, our longest serving uh, director, Ray Borlase, recently. And it's really interesting. It arouses certain emotions, doesn't it? There's a longing backwards. There's a worrying forwards, perhaps. There's gratitude for all they've given and all that we have gained in the process. Uh, there's fear over a perceived lack of stability in the moment. Who is taking over and where are they taking us? <laughs> Beyond that, we look to our church, don't we? And we see leaders... Uh, fall and leaders fail. Uh, leaders perhaps stuck the challenge of holding fast to the truth. Perhaps some of the older pillars of fidelity and faithfulness amongst us reaching the end of their race. And there are great shafts of light and great pillars of God in our church still today. And we praise God for those. But we do wonder, don't we, about a future for perhaps the non-established remnant. And, and beyond that, as I've mentioned, we look to our nation We look to a new king and we look at uh, our pantheistic post-Christian country and we look at all that we've received 
from our previous monarch and we consider what we may receive from our current monarch. And then as I've said, we look at our succession of prime ministers, which we'll think about and talk about and pray into more later today. We can perhaps identify a little bit, a little bit, with where God's people were at. And if you look at verse 2 of Judges chapter 1, we see that the Lord calls Judah and Simeon. You see that? The Lord said, Judah shall go up. Indeed, I have delivered the land into his hand. And so Judah then says to Simeon, his brother, come up with me to my allotted territory that we may fight against the Canaanites. And I will likewise go with you to your allotted territory. And Simeon went with him. These are subdivisions of God's people, extended families, if you like. They reach across the aisle to work together positively in God's prophetic purpose with devastating impact. And if we were to fast forward to the end of chapter 1, uh, which we don't necessarily need to read, but verses 27 and 28 of chapter 1, we see there's a fundamental impasse. There's a, a stressful situation in that hour because another half-tribe, Manasseh, did not, it says, drive out the inhabitants. For the Canaanites, get this, were determined to dwell in that land. And it came to pass when Israel was strong that they put the Canaanites under tribute, and get this as well, but did not completely drive them out. So significant, friends. So significant. Verse 29 onwards, we see other tribes, Ephraim, Zebulun, Asher, Naphtali and Dan. Uh, although notable credit for Joseph, who improved on Dan's retreat, but still only brought the Amorites into servitude. They also failed in their own missions against God's enemies that he put them alongside. And as a consequence, God's enemies bent on that unholy trinity of earthly pleasure, earthly possessions and counterfeit gods found a place within God's people. Now you don't need to turn there. 1 John chapter 2 verse 16, we find these words. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So right out of the gate here, it kind of makes me think of God's people at church here today in our aisles. I'm not making immediate direct parallels. Uh, almost uh, all, I assume, if not all of us here today, and in intercessors for Britain perhaps more widely, aren't Jews. But as we looked at the supposedly grafted in church in the UK today, by differing degrees, so many tribes in so many places have failed to drive out the world and the foreigners, God has put them there to drive out. And we can look at the Methodists and their forsaking of the gospel in pursuit of non-biblical marriage. We could consider the Church of England. We could look at the Church of Scotland. We could look at the Baptist Union. It's so easy to point the finger, isn't it, at established greater tribes, perhaps. Where am I? Where are you this morning? I wonder, what have I gone soft on or compromised on? Whose voice and influence lives inside of you that the Lord is calling upon you to evict? We looked at, in verse 1 of chapter 1, this whole body corporate voice that the Lord had dealings with. And it's interesting, just in way, uh, by way of passing, uh, to consider the division in the body of Christ and God's people at this time, isn't it? We know that John 17, uh, Jesus says these words, And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be, may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me. And I've loved them as you have loved me. Explode that outwards to the world and the history of the church international. Well, let's, Judges chapter 2, we're, we're kind of just coming up here uh, through this whistle-stop tour. 
And chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, we'll read because I think they're critical. Judges chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. Then the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I led you up from Egypt and brought you to the land of which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Therefore, I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns in your side and their gods shall be a snare to you. So it was when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the children of Israel that the people lifted up their voices and wept. Now, no single angel, you look at verse one again, No single angel led them up from Egypt, brought them into the promised land or made a covenant with them. This is Jesus, friends. This is Jesus. Jesus, that ever-present person throughout the Old Testament as well as the New, visited his people. And if you don't believe me, you have to chat with Abraham, who met with Jesus. See that in Genesis chapter 18. Jacob, who met with Jesus in Genesis 32. Joshua, who met with Jesus in Joshua chapter 5. And if they're not good enough for you, you can even argue with Charles Spurgeon after the service, perhaps. It's incredible that Jesus involves himself in this way, isn't it? Such a direct, personable way. It's what he always has done. He says, don't make a covenant with them. There's this central charge. You've obeyed somebody else's voice. So you're stuck with them now. They're under your skin. And we do well to weep in such situations, don't we, friends? We do very well to weep. But I love what Spurgeon says about weeping. Uh, I'll, I'll read it to you, the quote. The tear is the natural drop of moisture and soon evaporates. The better thing is the inward torrent of grief within the soul, which leaves the indelible mark within. One grain of faith is better than a gallon of tears. A drop of genuine repentance is more precious than a torrent of weeping. Isn't that a great quote? Chapter 2, verse 7, it says, So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. But it appears the Lord is going to work in a more direct way with his people in this new season that Joshua's death makes the way for. You see that in verse 4 of chapter 2 when we read it, he spoke these words to the children of Israel. We're not sure precisely how. No doubt there were leaders. There were leaders of tribes, leaders of clans, leaders of families. There were delegates, no doubt, in a practical sense. But this is just, uh, but just before Joshua dies, it's almost as if he stands to one side as the conversation happens. Joshua hasn't passed away yet, but it's as if he's at the side as this conversation happens. And it's almost as if he's bringing them together, perhaps, as his last act. Chapter 2, verse 10. Just read that. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. Perhaps we might think it should be the other way round. Perhaps we might think that it might say they didn't know the work he had done and therefore they didn't know him. (laughs) But it's very striking that it speaks of knowing God first. Knowing God. And lock that in your mind, not only for the duration of this talk, but also the second talk later in the day, because I think it's pertinent. (laughs) Verse 11, let's read that together, says, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and served the Baals. So here we go into the so-called dark ages of Israel's history. And, and some Bible commentators refer to it as such. I'm not so sure. I think that's a little bit of a misnomer because in the midst of this dark period, we see grace and we see guts. And in that sense, it's akin to most every other era, isn't it? But there's no doubt that God's people are entering a particularly long and dark era. 340 years 
or thereabouts without any official leader. No king, no president, no dictator even, no military junta, no prime minister even, just God in heaven and a fantastic and fascinating procession of deliverers who God's spirit would usher in for a season through murky or perhaps totally non-existent electoral processes and without formal coronation. And then just like that, they would exit stage left. I wonder if that sounds familiar. Chapter 2, verses 15 through to 19. This is a great summary. Uh, Judges 2, 15. Wherever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for calamity, as the Lord had said. How sad is that? And as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were greatly distressed. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but they played the harlot with other gods and bowed down to them. They turned quickly from the way in which their fathers walked in obeying the commandments of the Lord. They did not do so. And when the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who oppressed them and harassed them. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they reverted and behaved more corruptly than their fathers. So sad, isn't it? By following other gods to serve them and bow down to them. They did not cease from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. I want you to hold that uh, in tension or alongside Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, you can turn there if you wish, and I'm happy to read uh, for us too. But Hebrews chapter 11 uh, and verses 32 to 34. Hebrews 11 verses 32 to 34. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens it's not bad for the dark ages is it <laughs> but it still was dark and we understand that i wish we had time to consider judges uh, as a full book uh, today there's so much in here of course but to complete our introduction will you fast forward with me to the last verse of the book please judges chapter 21 verse 25 judges chapter 21 and verse 25 and we'll read it Judges chapter 21 and verse 25. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Many chapters throughout Judges begin with there was no king in Israel. Here we have a sort of summary of the whole era. And it's a miserable epitaph, isn't it? Miserable. Obviously, there hadn't been a king before. So this is a retrospective assessment, even to talk of kings. Uh, and we know that Judges is traditionally thought to, be, to have been compiled by Samuel. In truth, it might be that a blend of Samuel's records, together with scribes and recorders who lived during David's reign, contributed to this narrative that we now appreciate today. But before we leave Judges... There is another accidental summary tucked away in chapter 8, verse 23, which, if you want to turn there, it might actually be more instructive to us. I've found it very helpful. Uh, in the aftermath of Gideon and God's great victory, you remember that shout, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon? Isn't that a great phrase? Coming together of God and a godly leader. Over the Midianites, that victory, uh, Israel... Tell Gideon that he must rule over them. He must. And yet Gideon's response is choice, isn't it? Uh, chapter 8 
and verse 23. Uh, what does he say? But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. So who did end up ruling over God's people? Well, we obviously turn the pages forward, past Samuel, the last judge, and through to Saul, Israel's first king. So this is where we get into 1 Samuel, and 1 Samuel chapter 8. Uh, if your finger's been in there the whole time, I apologise. <laughs> 1 Samuel 8, turn there please. It's a bit of a crisis. Samuel, the great hero of our faith, the miracle child, fostered by Eli in a spare bedroom in the house of the Lord, which was a tabernacle in Shiloh in those days. Samuel, the hearer of the mighty whisper, the seer of vision, the feeder of the eternal word to God's covenant people. Himself, the taker over from a blind and fleshly priesthood, receiver of the ark, builder of altars, this Samuel, the original circuit superintendent, asks his sons to step up and become judges. But they are no chip off the old block. They're liars, thieves and care nothing for justice and the rule of God's law. And it reminds me of what an old Methodist come independent evangelical forefather in North Yorkshire told me a number of years ago. He was very fond of saying to me, Josh, every generation needs to find and know God for themselves. It's what he'd seen play out in vivid technicolor through his Methodist years that ended in evangelicalism. And so the elders of Israel come and say, look, Samuel, they're just not you. And it's interesting, they could have asked him to call them to book. Uh, you remember this is a pattern. Eli um, came into great trouble before the Lord because he did not restrain his sons. And yet the people say, look, we need a king. We need a king like the other nations. The other nations we've fought against, the other nations who've sought to dominate and deceive us, they have kings. We want a king. And it's really interesting, isn't it, as we uh, come this morning, haven't recent days underlined the extent to which we clamour for a physical person to lead us? And we quake without that clarity of direction, perhaps regardless of what direction it is. We just want somebody to set out the direction for us. It's really interesting uh, when Liz Truss gave tribute to Queen Elizabeth II, she said that Queen Elizabeth II was the rock on which modern Britain was built. Britain is the great country it is today because of her. I'm not sure I'd go along with that. But let's see Samuel's reaction to the people's complaint. Well, you see that in verse 6, 1 Samuel 8 verse 6. He's not happy. <laughs> the thing displeased Samuel. And perhaps he took it as a personal slight on his family and his family name. Uh, and it was offence perhaps taken at a family besmirched. As I said, remember Eli and sons. But he does what's right. As his mother had done all those years ago. And he takes it to the Lord. And what's the Lord's reaction in verses 7 through to 9? Let's read them. The Lord said to Samuel, heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, with which they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. Now therefore, heed their voice. However, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behaviour of the king who will reign over them. What's the Lord saying? He's saying, it's not you, Samuel. It's me. I want to reign over them, but they won't submit to my authority. They're forsaking you now as they've always forsaken me, ever since Egypt. And the Lord says this, give them what they're asking for. But in the process, warn them. And tell them what it will be like to serve a monarch. So Samuel does what's asked of him. And through verses 10 to 18, you get conscription, tax, servitude, all the rest of it. He's saying you'll regret it. 
But the people aren't bothered. They want a worldly king, don't they? Who will make them blend in with the rest of the world, deal with their disputes, lead them victoriously into battle. You see that in verses 19 to 20. So Samuel relays their response to the Lord. Obviously the Lord knows, but there is power and there's progress, isn't there, friends, in speaking it out in the Lord's hearing, as we will do as we come and pray. It's intercession. That's what Samuel's doing. And so the Lord says, finally, go ahead, give them what they're asking for. And in chapter nine, we're going to meet him. We're going to meet this king. He's got a great family tree. He's handsome. He's tall. And he's even humble with it. We see that in 1 Samuel 15, verse 17. Uh, the Lord through Samuel says, you are little in your own eyes, was Saul. He believes in asking God to show him the way that he should go. I don't know if you remember this lost donkeys saga where Saul sent on. Uh, God leads him to Samuel. He listens to Saul. And we're going to go very quickly through these first phases of Saul's life. But in chapter 10, we see that he's anointed symbolically. His heart is supernaturally changed into a new, different heart. Chapter 10, verse 9. The Spirit comes upon him in power. He prophesies. And people wonder at him. And I want you to see this. Just track with me in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 12. Love this. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 12. So here comes Saul. He's, he's, he's come across these uh, prophets in the road. And as he interacts with them, the Spirit comes upon him. He begins to prophesy. And people are like, we thought he was just Kish's son. There's no way he's a prophet now. And then some unnamed sage, what a legend, who happens to live there says the immortal words. You see this in chapter 10, verse 12. Uh, a man from there answered and said, but who is their father? He's just like, you know, all this commotion. Wow, Saul, this new guy, king, what a guy. He's prophesying now. And he's just like, well, who's his father? And I, I love that because... It captures for us precisely, I believe, what this is all about. What this is all about. Friends, people will always question you and I, won't they, based on our physical lineage. They'll always say, well, you're just a human. What do you know? They'll question your breeding, perhaps, or your education. They'll project, perhaps, your physical stature, your vocation, your country of origin, and your CV onto the entirety of your future. And they'll refuse to believe that God could adopt you and could so take a hold of me that we become new in his hand and do things and say things they could never have expected and will never truly believe. But they say, we say these things and all these things happen because God is our father. Hallelujah. No other reason. We've been born again into a new family with a new dad and a new destiny and all things are possible. And friends, this is a day, is it not, for stepping boldly out into the fire, knowing who your father is. It's a day for standing up in strength, not because your physical family, your church family, your pastor or even your bank manager have got your back. But because God is your father, the king of kings and the lord of lords that we've worshipped this morning is our king. He's with you. He's with you in the fire. He's with you as a shelter in the storm. He'll lead you through the fiercest battle. Go nowhere else, friends, and do nothing else but stand in the name of the one who will not leave you. And in truth, I hope and I trust and I pray you could not leave even if you wished, because he has done everything for you. He's adopted you. And those great words of the disciples, to whom else shall we go? He's given us the words of eternal life, friends, hasn't he? He's given himself for us, and that's why we give himself, uh, give ourselves sorry, to him. But beyond this, and sorry, I digress a little bit there. Um, this comment shows, doesn't it, where the people are at. Because there shouldn't be anything surprising about God moving on someone's heart and someone's life 
so deeply, so supernaturally, so dynamically and so powerfully. Nothing, friends, nothing. It's who God is and it's what he does. And a nation submitted to that notion knows this. But God's people don't know it in this moment. They don't know it. That's why it's strange to them. The eyes of their head guide them rather than the eyes of their heart. And they need a big guy with big ideas to lead them in a big battle against big enemies. And we'll talk more about that in talk two. But in closing, as we move towards prayer, we need to finish this uh, initial journey uh, into uh, Saul. And in uh, chapter 10, the remainder of chapter 10, um, verses through verses 17 to 27, which we don't have time to read through, uh, we see Mizpah. This all takes place at a place called Mizpah, which means watchtower. Samuel reminds them of their salvation. He tells them they've rejected God. That's the charge, friends, in verse 19. Uh, chapter 10, verse 19. You have today rejected your God. Uh, the people are excited when they see the great physical specimen God has given them. Verse 24. They get a textbook about kingship and what it's going to look like for the king and for them. And every man goes home in verse 25. And what's interesting is there are valiant men whose hearts God had touched, who go with Saul, that's in verse 26. But there are some rebels who say, can this man save us? How can this man save us? And they despise him. That's verse 27. Now the rest of Saul's journey will be familiar to so many of you. Uh, we'll try and sum up the rest of the story chapter by chapter. Be a great injustice, I'm aware of that, but we do need to move on. Chapter 11, Saul proves himself a patriot, a mighty battle commander, and his power is consolidated. Chapter 11, friends, is Saul's high point. Chapter 12, we're going to come back to in a second to finish. Chapter 13, Saul gets in a pickle, panics, and pretends to be a priest, which is just not a good idea. Chapter 14, the Philistines gain the upper hand. And they are routed by Saul's courageous son, Jonathan. And Saul places his people under a foolish, fleshly oath that limits their victory. What they started in the spirit, they try to finish in the flesh. Chapter 15, the Amalekites are beaten, but Saul stops short of full obedience and doesn't destroy them completely. The Lord, therefore, regrets installing Saul as king. Samuel's own heart is broken by God's heart. And again, the charge is one of rejection. Saul rejected the word of the Lord and was consequently rejected by him. And beyond this, before we just rewind to chapter 12, Saul's life goes on into a, what is essentially a lengthy crossover with the incoming heir, David. Talk about a handover period. And then there's this kind of grisly and chaotic demise of Saul as the Lord departs from him and he suffers under a distressing spirit that the Lord sent. We'll look at that in chapter 16 in the second talk. It's a right royal roller coaster, isn't it? And it's punctuated by these fits of peak and these glimmers of softness, but against a deepening backdrop of darkness. It's really, really sad. So sad, these chapters. The final turgid throes of a man who could have been and done so much more. But let's rewind. Chapter 12. 1 Samuel 12. And we'll just look at Samuel's final exhortation to Israel in the beginning of Saul's reign. And it's here in verses 13 to 15 of chapter 12. It's the choice that he lays before them. The choice Joshua gave the people. The choice the Lord lays before us today. And it's done in such a way as to describe the relationship between a grafted in church and Christ their king and head. This is Samuel addressing the people, not their king. This is corporate, direct, in that same sense of Judges chapter 1. Let's read in verses 13 through to 15. Now therefore, here is the king whom you have chosen and whom you have desired. And take note, the Lord has set a king over you. If you fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and do not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then both you and the king who reigns over you will continue following 
the Lord your God. However, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandments of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you, as it was against your fathers. Fear the Lord, serve him, obey his voice. I'm underlining that for us. Obey his voice. Do not rebel against the commandment of the Lord. And it's really interesting how Samuel says, then both you and the king who reigns over you will continue following the Lord your God. Do you see that? There's a mutuality about this. There's almost an equality about it. If we mere minions follow God together, our leaders will follow God. If our leaders follow God, we will follow God too. There's a beautiful togetherness, a symbiotic relationship outlined here for us. Our leaders cannot hide behind us. Do you remember this? This is what Saul tried to do, right? In the aftermath of the battle against the Amalekites. He said, oh, it's the people who took the plunder. Leaders can't hide behind us. We cannot hide behind our leaders. Because the people had no excuse because they asked for Saul. So friends, this, is all, this has always been our choice. Whoever our leaders are or are not, God issues a timeless corporate call to us. And it is striking in its simplicity. It is plainly this. Do everything that I tell you to do. When Samuel uttered those words, Saul still followed the Lord. And the Lord still dwelt with Saul. But it would not last long at all. And today we find ourselves in a situation where increasingly our spiritual leaders have rejected God's voice. And he has departed from them. But the timeless call to us this morning still stands we must rededicate ourselves afresh to it now i believe because as we'll talk more about in talk two i believe that we're at the top now of a deep descent that will see the so-called church its so-called christian in inverted commas leaders and their followers completely decouple from god's truth and then turn and look to throw the spear at those who are faithful. Which I trust is you and I this morning. And their desire will be to pin us to the wall. Because the hand of the Lord is against them, their hand will be against us. So today, we must choose, as Joshua did, for ourselves, and where applicable, our wives and our children, maybe our businesses, maybe our charities, definitely our jobs, be they paid or voluntary, and perhaps our churches, or perhaps our relationship with our churches. We must do what he tells us to do in his word. I trust, friends, this morning that we can be one of those valiant people that Jesus, heart, uh, that Jesus has touched our hearts. I pray that we can be those people. Remember that from what we read? There were valiant people whose hearts the Lord had touched. Or perhaps are we a rebel this morning, doubting perhaps whether he can save and perhaps despising him. We can go into those places. Well, let's finish with these words. Turn back to Joshua chapter 24. The words that preceded, the words that preceded the story of Saul <laughs> that we just went through. Joshua 24, we'll finish with these words. Joshua 24 and verse 15. And if it seems evil to you, to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord.